welcome everyone uh, that's uh, with us tonight. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Tracy Ewer. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a veterinarian. I've graduated from North Carolina State University in Raleigh in uh, 1997. Um, I own and run Moyoc Animal Hospital down in Moyoc, North Carolina, out in the boonies. And we do 99% dogs and cats. I do a few cows for my father only because he says I still owe him tons of money for all the school he put me through. Um, one other thing I'd like to say, make sure you please at the end of this, I know most of the veterinarians in the area, if you go back to your veterinarian tomorrow, please don't say Dr. Tracy told me this or Tracy told me that. Listen to what they say. They are smart and they are all very good. So if you take any recommendations away or anything like that, just make sure that you are listening to them because they're all good folks. So anyway, with that, Joel, we'll go from there. Awesome. Um, okay, so uh, the first question, most importantly, uh, and especially, uh, so this one applies to our pets, not us. Um, even though some of us are struggling with the, the COVID-19 and the additional weight. Um, but first question off the bat, what kind of a diet should I feed my pet? That's an excellent question. I get asked that all the time. You are going to find a lot of um, veterinarians who have very specific answers for that. You're going to find a lot of information uh, on the internet if you look that up. I am a lot more lenient. And what I mean by that is, is that the vast majority of dogs and cats can eat any reasonably priced brand name food. Um, and I always make fun of myself when I say this, if I had a bit of food poured in front of me two to three times a day and ate exactly what my owner, my doctor, my wife told me to eat, I would be perfect weight, look great, and everything would go well. But the problem that, that we run into as people is we, I'm, like me, I ate everything. It's pizza tonight and steak tomorrow night. So that's the issue that you go through there. With dogs and cats, if, if the dogs or cats are not having a medical issue, pick your name brand that you have heard of before. Um, people ask me all the time, should I buy this expensive food? There's nothing wrong with expensive food if you can afford it. If you find yourself eating mayonnaise sandwiches while your dog is eating this $80 a bag food, you probably should buy something less expensive than that. Um, and so I, I think of just names of Purina and, and, and things like that. They've been around for forever. They make great food. So there's, and for most cases, there's nothing wrong with a regular um, dog food that you can find at the store. There are some concerns that people have heard about recently in the past few years about a grain-free diet. <clears throat> grain-free diets, when I was in school back in, in the day, um, were only prescription foods. That was the only way you could get them. And um, those foods were tailor-made for dogs who either had a allergy towards grains or who had a GI issue with grains. And so they found recently <clears throat> that some dogs are having a cardiac issue associated with long-term grain-free food. So dogs are supposed to eat a little grain here and there. And so what I tell folks is, is that if you have a medical reason to be on a grain-free food, use it. If you don't get off of it and go, go to something in the more generalized category. Um, there are a few dogs who are going to need, cats too, who are going to need a specific pres prescription food based on medical issues that they have. Things like uh, liver issues, kidney disease, um, cats are big with urinary issues and crystal formation. So anything like that, you want to follow your veterinarian's recommendation for what prescription food to use. But otherwise, the vast majority of dogs and cats can eat a reasonably priced brand named regular food. Continue. Excellent. Okay. Um, and we have a, a slide for this that you've created. So I'm going to pop this up there. Um, so you can talk about this a little bit. And also, uh, what foods um, in addition to this, what foods are dangerous for dogs or cats to eat? Excellent, excellent. So <clears throat> what you're looking at is a slide that we stuck together. Hunter has made, has made fun of other people for making fun of her dog. And Hunter's dog just a little while ago got a little chubby. Now he's back. If you look at him now, he's in the kind of getting close down to the healthy weight range. I'm going to make fun of myself and my wife Emily right now. The top right picture is my cat named Britches. Britches, if you look at him, is kind of gigantic and he's in the fat chubby realm. Um, <clears throat> and so a lot of people ask me all the time about dieting their animal and, and what kind of diet foods to use. There are a lot of brand name diet foods that, that you can buy at any grocery store or any pet food store that work really, really well. Um, the other issue is, is that 
the vast majority of animals that are overweight are simply overweight, just like the vast majority of people are. They just eat too much. Um, <clears throat> I have a story that I always tell all of my clients. Um, years ago, I was at my general practitioner and I looked at him and I said, I think I'm a little chubby. And he said, no, you're fat. And I said, okay, that's great. What I'll need to do. He said, you need to get up from the table every time you eat. And if you were not hungry, you ate too much. And that is kind of the same aspect that you should look at with the animals. If you find your animal all the time looking at you and going, boy, I'm stuffed, then you're just feeding the thing too much. And there's only a couple of medical reasons for a dog to be overweight. Um, the biggest one in canines is, is a, a, a low thyroid, a hypothyroid issue. Short of that, if the animal is too fat, they're simply eating too much. A lot of people also ask me, Tracy, I'm going to throw the ball a little bit more. First, if you think that you're gonna exercise one ounce off a cat, that is absolutely useless. A cat wakes up in the morning and the first thing they wanna think about is what you're gonna do for them. So they have no, no inclination of doing anything to try to lose any weight. And very few dogs are gonna do anything more than what they wanna do, what kind of fun they wanna have. And so I tell folks exercise is great, but it's very hard to exercise weight off a dog. And the other thing I always tell folks is if you roll the bag of food over, and look at the, the amount of food recommendation that they give. You have to remember that their job and the way they make money is to sell more food. So the recommendation for the food amount given on the back of any food bag is usually ridiculously too much. Um, and so I tell folks, if the dog or cat is chubby, cut the food. And if three months later, it's still chubby, cut the food again. And that will usually do the trick for you. Oh, and you also asked y'all, I apologize, what foods might be dangerous for dogs and cats? The most common ones that we see that are dangerous for dogs and cats would be, um, you can put that slide, there you go, Joe. The most common foods that are dangerous for dogs and cats that are readily available in any house would be chocolate is a big one, um, grapes, raisins, uh, garlic, and onions. There's a whole lot of other stuff. Christmas time has a lot of things that are a problem, uh, mistletoe, holly berries, and things like that. Um, some of those foods, if they eat them, only cause GI upset. Um, but some of them can be really dangerous. Chocolate causes a lot of heart issues. Um, anything in the grape or raisin category can cause a, a, a pretty severe kidney disease. And it's very dog specific. Some dogs or cats can eat them with no trouble. Some dogs cannot. Um, I always tell owners, people ask me all the time, just as a little bit of a sideways story about like first aid in dogs and what do they need? Everybody at their house has something for the cut on the dog, the bandage, the band-aid, the thing like that, the, the neosporin or cream for a cut or something along those lines. But the number one thing you can have, I have one here, is one big bottle of hydrogen peroxide. Every dog owner should have this. We'll talk about cats in a second. Now, if you have a bottle of hydrogen peroxide, I promise you yours is open and or out of date. Um, you need a brand new bottle sealed and in date only because that is what works the best. Um, now, when you have, find your dog and you say to yourself, my dog has eaten a bag full of chocolate chips or something along those lines, it rarely hurts anything. Even if you're just worried, did the dog eat rat poison? Did the dog eat anything that you're scared of? If it is not a knife, um, a sewing needle, if it is not something that is going to cause damage coming back up, the best thing to do is to grab your peroxide and it's kind of weight based, but I tell owners almost anything will do. If your dog is little, a half a tablespoon. If your dog is big, a tablespoon. Repeat it in 10 minutes. They will vomit almost 90% of the time, 95% of the time, and get that stuff back out. Um, cats are a little different. I'm not saying that cats are smarter, so all the dog lovers out there don't get upset with me over that. Cats rarely, they smell something, I don't want that. The big thing that cats get into are some foreign object strings and stuff like that. So you don't have near as much trouble with cats eating stuff they're not supposed to. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you for that. Yeah. So hydrogen peroxide and make sure it's in date and you've got plenty of it. In date and new. New bottle, top on, seal. Yes, sir. Excellent. Yeah. Life-saving tip there. <laughs> okay. So keeping with the theme of food and eating things, a uh, very interesting question. Um, maybe you don't have to go in so much detail, but why does my dog eat poop? Oh, that's a good one. That's a very, very good one. We see dogs. So back on the cats again, cats never do that. That is not a cat problem. I don't know. Maybe they're, they know better, but cats don't do that. We see dogs every day that eat poop. Now, here's my poop eating story. I have a product at my office. Every veterinarian sells it. Um, it's not terribly expensive. It is made to deter your dog from eating poop. So first let's go back. Why do dogs eat poop? The vast majority of dogs that eat poop eat it because they absolutely think it's fun and it tastes good. It sounds ridiculous to us, but that's their favorite thing to do. 
And when a dog starts to eat poop, it does not matter what you tell it, no matter how much you scold it, they will continue to eat it if they think it's fun. And we see them eat anything from the old dry stuff to the steamy new stuff. And so it's kind of gross, but they do it all the time. Now, the way to stop a dog from doing that, and I kind of put it in three categories. Um, your veterinarian can sell you something, and if you want to buy it, that's great. The best thing to do, though, is go to your grocery store and buy the cheapest generic can of crushed pineapple that you can find. And here's the key to it. You've got to put the pineapple on top of everybody's food that the dog might be eating the poop of, including himself. So you feed all the dogs a big spoonful of pineapple over their meal every time they have a meal for at least 7 to 14 days. The longer the dog eats, the more pineapple you give it. The pineapple makes the poop taste so godforsakenly bad that they eventually stop eating. Now, if you have a dog that is, let's call it 8, 10, 12 weeks old, the puppy, you're going to stop them about 95% of the time. You can break it. It's a pretty easy habit to break. If the dog's a couple of years old, maybe. If the dog's 10 years old eating poop, forget about it. Don't even use the pineapple. It's like trying to tell my old father to do something different. He's not going to do it. So I tell folks, if it's older and you're done with, just turn your head and let him eat. Now, one other thing that people ask me all the time is they say to me, Tracy, my dog runs into the, where the cat's litter box is and eats cat poop. Number one, you're not going to get your cat to eat pineapple or any product that any veterinarian sells you. And number two, when a dog eats cat poop, they think that that is better than any treat or candy that you can possibly give them. And veterinarians will tell you a whole lot of different remedies and things to do. The number one thing to do is take your cat's litter box, put it up on top of something where the dog can't reach it and forget it because they're not going to stop. My dog ate cat poop for 12 years and thought it was great every day that she got to eat. It was her favorite treat on earth. Anyway. Excellent. Okay. Crushed pineapple. <laughs> Crushed pineapple. Excellent. Good tip. Okay, um, so we're gonna, the next few questions, we're gonna kind of change gears a little bit um, before we get too much further down the, uh, down the disgusting trail. Um, <laughs> and we're gonna talk about breeds for a little bit. Um, and I've got a slide for this next one uh, for cats in particular, but can you tell us um, what's the best dog or cat breed to get? And I've got a follow-up question that actually came in from the comments um, and it's talking about, if you could say a little bit about mixed breeds in dogs versus purebred um and what if one is better healthier um uh, any any little information you can provide on that so what's the yeah, best yeah. cat dog breed okay so we'll do dogs first and cats second the best dog breed is absolutely going to be owner dependent so i'm going to give you a smeary wishy-washy answer um the best dog breed is owner dependent simply because it depends on a what you're looking for and b what you're expecting and then probably c think about it and put some reality into it. Um, if you are looking to get a dog and the dog is, and let's make up an easy story. You live in an apartment somewhere and you know, you've got 1200 square feet and you got to go down three flights of stairs. The last thing you need is some super over the top hot dog that wants to go and, you know, run around all the time and do all sorts of things. That dog is better suited, you know, somewhere where you've got five acres and that sort of thing. Um, if you like to sit and watch TV, you need a breed that likes to sit and watch TV. Um, if you like to run six miles a day, you need a breed that likes to run six miles a day. And so most of the time, if a person gets a dog that they end up not, um, not liking, I'll just say it that way, the problem is, is that they probably picked the breed of dog that did not suit their lifestyle. So you have to kind of investigate and look at what dogs you think you want to have. The other thing is, is as silly as it sounds, it, when you go and see the dog, look at the dog, and if that dog looks like it's something that you can handle and, and you, you, know, you, you see all the situations around it, that's kind of the thing to do. So that's kind of an open answer. The other thing I tell folks is, is that if you look around and see the most popular dogs, they're the most popular for a reason. Um, Hunter says her dog's the greatest dog on earth. My dog that passed away a few years ago is really the greatest dog on earth. Hers is the second greatest dog on earth, but she has a golden retriever and I had a Labrador retriever. I'm not pushing those two breeds other than the fact that they've been the number one or number two breed in America for probably the last 15 years. Um, and, but that is not a great dog in that 1200 square foot apartment, three flights up. Um, so that's an issue that, that you have there. Um, if we look over at Steven with his little pup, perfect. Absolutely perfect little dog. Um, and so that works great in, in, a, in a city or in a place where you can't go around a lot. The other thing that I tell people to, to watch out for is that some people think that they, I'm not picking with German Shepherds, I love them. We see them every day. But if you have a dog that's a little bit on, not aggressive is the wrong word, if he's on the tendency to be kind of macho, 
He's not a dog that you need around thousands of people unless you have him really well trained. So that's that's kind of the, the the thing I say with breeds. Kind of pick it as you go and ask everybody what kind of dog did you have, what did you like, and how did it work out for you? Um, because most of the time that's kind of the answer. Um, I know Miss Elizabeth, she had a uh, chocolate lab, very, very nice dog, well trained, works great. So you, you kind of pick a dog that you know is going to be good and you don't always know. Sometimes you're going to get one that's a little rough, but training helps out with that as well. Um, and so I tell folks to kind of watch out for that. Um, on the cat side of things, the vast majority of cats in the United States fall under what is labeled in the veterinary world as the either DSH or DLH. That stands for domestic short hair and domestic long hair. That means we don't know what they are. They're mixed up with a thousand things and they're American cats. And so they're kind of great. And here's one I see Miss Sandy has hers. That's her rescue cat. And so that they, they are they're kind of ubiquitous. There's nothing wrong with that. And those are the ones that you just pick because the cat kind of took to you. Um, on the mixed breed versus pure breed side of things, um, I'm, like I said, I, I've, I've had a, a, a registered Labrador Retriever, but I'm also very big on kind of the rescue dog. All the cats we have are rescues here, like Miss Sandy's is. And the rescue dog is, or not even just the rescue dog, the mixed breed dog generally is going to have less medical problems simply because in the breeding of things, when you start to breed dogs like the Golden Retriever, Labrador Retriever, the German Shepherd, people over the years and years and years and years, and I don't mean 10 years, I mean generations of dogs have bred for specific things. They like the blocky, blocky head or the beautiful hair coat or that sort of thing. Sometimes though that brings in problems because they neglected the bad hips that's in the Labrador Retriever. They neglected other things that go on that sometimes are exacerbated. And if you statistically look at the length of age of life of a mixed breed 50 pound dog versus a or 60 pound dog versus a pure breed Labrador Retriever. If you statistically look at it over time, they're going to outlive the pure breed dog statistically all the time, just because they do have far less chronic medical problems or medical problems that continue to pop up. Yeah. Awesome. Excellent. Um, so a follow up question to that. Uh, how do you determine if a breeder is reputable? Maybe what are some red flags to look out for um, things that, that look good when you go to see a, an animal breeder? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I forgot one thing, Joel, back on that last question. Um, we also had a question about um, cats with hair versus fur. That's a very interesting question. I don't get asked that very much, but that was uh, one that somebody had submitted. So all animals have fur in general, but the distinction there is, is that if you think about your regular cat or regular dog, they're gonna have the hair and they're gonna have an undercoat underneath of it. And they're gonna be kind of furry for lack of a better way of describing it. There are a few breeds of cats that have what would be classified as just hair and not so much fur or dander underneath three or four to think of, and we had them, do we have one? No, let's do it. Do we have a picture of that? There we go. So the Cornish Rex up in the top left and the Devon Rex and the Sphinx, those, those cats have, um, I would kind of guess I would say less hair, especially in the case of the Sphinx. But the big thing there is, is that when people love these cats, they love them and they're great animals. They're very nice. They have a really good personality. And the other thing about these is that for people who have allergies, um, to cats or to animals in general, these usually cause far less allergic issues in humans to, to people who have them than say your standard regular domestic cat. Um, and these are really nice guys with personalities and they have the best ears ever. Um, also, one other question that, that we were asked is, how do you find these types of cats? You know, where do you go get them? That's part of the breeder question as well. Um, one of the things that I tell folks about looking for a breeder, and Joel, you can slide back if you want to. One of the things I tell folks about looking for a breeder is that that is hard. The vast majority of breeders are trying to do a good job, not to sound blunt, whether they are or not. They, nobody's out to be malicious or ugly in most cases. What I tell folks is, look for a breeder just like you would look for anything. If you know, you would look around for, I don't know, the, the best car dealer and that sort of thing. You're looking for reputation. Um, I would use the internet for what it's worth. I would ask people, Hunter, you have asked Hunter myself, you, you have a great dog, where'd you find this dog from? And I've recommended her breeder to two or three different people who were looking for a golden retriever simply because her dog is really nice and, it, and it's so far been very healthy and had no major problems at all. Um, so that's one thing that you can do. Also, the other thing that you can do is look for a group that um, is, is going to kind of vet these folks a little bit. Um, all three of those cat breeds we talked about are AKC registered type cats. And so you can, if you're looking for a puberty dog, you can look for, for anything under there. And, and then the other big thing I tell folks is like anything else, 
go to the breeder and if you have a bad feeling, walk away. If it sounds bad, it's bad. If it's too good to be true, it is. And that's with anything in life. But if you, if you have an issue, walk away and go find another one. There's too many dogs around. Now for your mixed breed animal, go to the shelter. There's a bazillion of them wagging their tail and meowing and waiting for you there. And, um, and even if you get one that's old or has a problem or has to have some work done, you did a good service for the, for the dog or cat. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Great, yeah. great, great plug for the shelter. Yeah. Um, and so, okay, so we find uh, either a breeder that's reputable or we go to the shelter. Um, when actually picking out an animal, what kind of behavior uh, should you look for? Or um, again, might be a red flag when choosing a, a dog or a cat. Sure, so, so that's, a, that's a very good one. Now, it kind of goes back to what you want, but most people, even if they think they want something rough and barky and house protective, they end up not wanting that. So what I tell folks is, is that when you go, we'll do dog and then we'll do cat. When you go and you look for the dog, if you've got a litter of puppies sitting in front of you at that breeder's place, the, the, the two extremes you don't want, the one that ran at you and jumped in your lap that everybody wants, that hit dog is going to be semi-obnoxious for forever. Um, the dog that is, is laying in the corner and when you touch it, it cries and starts to pee a little bit, he's gonna do that for forever unless you really work on him. And so I tell folks, the one that's kind of laying over there and sleeps and look up at, looks up at you and says, hey, Joe, how are you doing? That's probably the dog you want because he's kind of the middle of the road, laid back sort of guy. Dogs are like people, forgive me for saying that, but they are. There's some people that are really shy and they're very hard to bring out of that. And you can bring them up to here, but you can't bring them up to here. And the dog who is that person that you know, that's a little rough and a little, maybe not the greatest person in public, that dog's gonna be that same way, probably its whole life. You can bring it back down and make it a little better, but you'll never make it right there in the middle where you wanted it. So you kind of want that dog to just kind of hanging out with the group. Um, now, if you want the dog that wants to chase the ball 40 times a day and you're will willing to throw it and have the yard to throw it in, get the one that's jumping up and down at you the entire time because that's what he's going to do the rest of his life. Cats are a little bit different only because cats are, like I said, cats wake up in the morning and they're looking for what you want to do for them. Dogs are waking up in the morning and looking to help you. And that's not a bad thing about cats. That's just their personality. So uh, when you go and you look for that cat, you're, you're looking, of course, for help and that sort of thing but it's even more extreme. The cat that didn't hiss at you and the cat that didn't run away from you, the one still standing there is probably the one you want. And it's a simple answer, but that's probably the best answer. Yeah, no, well, that's, that's really helpful because you always, especially with dogs, I always thought, you know, people always want either the alpha of the pack and- Yes. Um, or, you, you know, if you've got a soft spot in your heart, everyone goes for the runt of the litter, but- Yes, and, and one other thing I, I forgot that, that, I, that I forgot to say, if you have now, for anyone who has, any group of dogs, I don't care if you have three, six, 10, it doesn't matter. If it's working out, bravo, it's working out. If you have one dog, cats are a little different, but if you have one dog in your house and it is, make this up, it is the male, might be a neutered male, hopefully it is if you're not planning to have puppies, and you decide I'm gonna get another dog, um, the best thing to do is to get a dog opposite sex, you get a female and spade if you have a male. The worst thing to do, and it often works out well, so for those of you who have two or three female dogs in your house and is working well, ignore this. But the worst thing to do, or the most common time to have a problem, is that if you have a female dog, and spayed or not, and you decide, and this dog is three or four, and you wanna get a friend for it, if you get another female dog, you have a decently high probability of them being very unhappy with each other at certain ages, such as when that dog turns two or three years old, and now that other dog is five or six years old. The reason being is that in the dog world, the girls are always in charge, um, kind of like at my house. The girls are always in charge. And so what I tell folks is, is that for a dog, um, when you have a female dog that is in charge of the group, they will be in charge. It doesn't matter if it's one dog or 30 dogs, they're going to be in charge. And so when you have another female comes in, they're going to try to challenge that a little bit. And we see more dog bites from household, in-household female biting female than we do any other group, including non-neutered males. And so just be careful with that because in the wild, whether it's the fox, whether it's the coyote, whether it's the, whatever it is, a wild dog, there's always a female in charge of that group. So that's just one thing to kind of watch out for. The males kind of go whatever and they go lay in a corner. That's, that's, they don't care. Yeah. Anyway, and that's not sexist, so just take uh it. <laughs> I was going to say, I'll, I'll keep my comments to myself. <laughs> I, I can relate, but. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, Me too. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Good, good stuff. Okay. Um, so we're going to shift gears uh, again a little bit. Um, talking about uh, 
dogs specifically um, and, and scent and, uh, and skill and behavior. Um, so I've got a two part question for him to kind of lump these together. Um, is nose work a good mental exercise? I hide treats in the house and our dog has to find them. And a follow up to that interesting question, can animals smell cancer? Gotcha. So very, very, very good question. So back, we'll do the nose work first, and then we'll talk about the cancer a little bit. In, yes, nose work is very, very good for a dog if that is what your dog wants to do. So kind of like making your dog exercise to lose weight. If an animal does not want to do it, it is extremely difficult to make them want to do it. So if you have a dog as you're trying to engage or to make them you know, more mentally sound or just more engaged, Nose work is great if the dog thinks that going to chase the treat or going to find the stuff is a great thing to do. If the dog's thing to do is sit and watch TV with you while you pet its ear, and that's its greatest thing in life, that's probably what you should do because that's what that dog wants you to do for it. Um, but yes, nose work is very, very good. Can dogs smell cancer? Yes, in certain types, and they use dogs for that. What those dogs are doing, though, is they're smelling something that that patient is giving off a pheromone, a hormone, an enzyme, something that makes them smell a tiny bit different from other people. The thing about smelling with dogs, dogs have a giant amount of, of better ability to smell than we do. But what happens with that is, is that when you're trying to train that dog, they're very specific dogs for that. I work with a whole bunch of service dogs that are trained to either um, sniff out bombs or drugs. And the, the guys, who guys and girls who train those dogs will tell you that what they're looking for is back on what does the dog want to do is that they're looking for dogs who they want something. And the one thing that they, those guys use is they just use most of the time it's a Kong. It's a treat. It's something they can hand them. And they will tell you if that dog will be excited about this one treat I give it, they can teach it to smell anything after that. And so it's very interesting to see that. Now, my dog, when she was still with me, she couldn't care less about doing much of anything. She wanted to sit on the couch. And so she would not have been a great dog for cancer smelling or drug smelling or anything. But it's not necessarily a specific dog for cancer smelling so much as it is as a dog who says, I love this job and I want you to hand me this every time I do it. So you train the dog without odor and the dog says, I smell that. I sit down. They give me that. I love it. It's the best day ever. And so that's what you're kind of teaching the dog to do. And you can do that with almost any animal. If, if you find out what an animal wants to do um, and reinforce it with a treat or something that they are happy about, they'll do it all day long forever for you. That's why dogs are so regimented in what they do in their daily life. Oh, one more story. Emily just reminded me. The, the, and if I'm going too long, Joel, just yell at me now. The, most of you remember Ring, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. We got to meet, now everybody has their own debate over the circus and I understand that. We got to meet when I was in veterinary school, he was still around, he's passed away now, uh, Gunther Gay Williams, who was the big lion tamer guy. And he trained, if you remember back in the day when we were all kids, he trained everything. He trained goats, he trained cats, he trained lions, anything, anything he could train it. And he, oh, he told us when we were in vet school, he said, Training an animal doesn't really have to do anything to do with training an animal. You figure out what the animal wants to do, and you just tell him good job for that. And there was always this giant lion that would sit on that big metal stand in the middle. And, and we all loved it as kids because he would walk by the lion and run by it. He'd point at it. The lion would just roar out loud. And somebody was giving him a treat every time he did that. But when they first started having that lion there, he said it was the laziest, sorriest lion he had ever seen. It just laid around. But he figured out that the lion kind of liked to roar. So every time he pointed at it, the lion would roar. And it made all the crowds and all the kids jump up and down. They thought it was the greatest thing on earth. And so that was kind of his philosophy. And it, and it really works on, on, uh, on animals. If you have something that they want to do and you reinforce it, if it's what you want them to do, they'll do it all day long. Yeah. Anyway, I'm sorry for my digression there. No, good stuff. Yeah, well, and so it, you can't, it, it's, it all depends on the animal, right? What they it does. Want to do it, it does. Yeah. So you can't teach every dog to do every trick. Exactly. Excellent. Good stuff. Okay. Um, next question. This one is really specific and uh, I'm just going to get into it. So why do dogs need their anal glands expressed? <laughs> and can one do that at home if one so chooses? Yes. Okay. That's a great gross question. Let's talk about that. First of all, people do not have anal glands. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Second, um, anal glands are, okay, I'm going to give you my, this is my press the play button that I do at work all the time when I talk to owners about this. Anal glands are two little sacs 
they are just inside the rectum of a dog. They're in the soft tissue surrounding the rectum. They are at approximately, if you look at the rectum like clock at four o'clock and eight o'clock, bottom left and bottom right, they have a tiny opening that goes on either side to a tiny sac that is attached to a tiny gland. What's supposed to happen is the anal glands make a watery brown smelly fluid that goes into the sac. When the dog passes stool, out onto the stool squirts the brown watery smelly fluid and it's kind of like a marking device like a male dog peeing on a bush. So the neighbor dog comes over and say, that's my buddy Joe, or I don't know who that dog is when he smells that. Anyway, um, most dogs do not have massive trouble with their anal glands. When dogs do, they usually are, it's more, much more common in small breed dogs, but it is much more common in large and small breed dogs for dogs who have allergy issues. Now, here's my big allergy plug for the evening. And I'll get back to the anal glands in, I promise. Um, allergies are the most common frustrating thing that the veterinary world deals with. And if an owner has a dog who has allergy problems, it will be the most frustrating thing you ever deal with with your dog. Um, think about people first. When people have allergies, we get usually, usually runny eyes, runny nose, and sinus trouble. When dogs have allergies, even though they're allergic to the same, dogs or cats, even though they're allergic to the same stuff we are, grass, weeds, pollen, stuff like that, what your neighbor planted, what your farmer's picking down the road, they are allergic to the same stuff we are, but they rarely exhibit those with major sinus trouble. It is almost always either itchy feet, itchy ears, itchy bad skin, or red inflamed ear canals, which is just a connection to the skin. And so that's kind of the prominent issue for anal glands. If your anal glands are not broke, don't try to fix them. Do not mess with them if the dog is not dragging his butt on the floor, licking his butt or making your house smell awful. Leave them alone. Now, if you have problems like that, so sometimes addressing the primary allergy problem will help fix the anal gland issue. But a lot of dogs are gonna be kind of chronic. I had one lady who had a little chihuahua. It was as big as a butter ball. And she had a standing Friday two o'clock appointment for the last five years of the dog's life. And we express the same glands every Friday. So it's very common in some dogs. Um, most of the time you can get it to stretch out much longer than that. Can you do them at home? Yes, if you can stomach it, do not do it over your carpet or in your anywhere you wanna eat, um, do it outside. There are two methods. One method is the, what I call the external method you almost need to have a veterinarian show you how to do it. Um, the other method is the internal method. Nobody likes that, but yes, you can, but you've got to have somebody face to face show you how to do that. And most people go, oh my God, I'll never do that again. And that's the end of it. Okay. Anyway. So don't try this at home unless you're a trained professional or, <laughs> or, or had trained, some training or trained or by training. a professional. <laughs> okay. Good no. stuff. Excellent. Okay. Um, moving on. So uh, pet, pet behavior, um, unwanted pet behavior. How do I get my young dog or puppy to stop attacking and chewing my furniture? Okay, I have to back up one second on because I had to submit a question about floppy ears. Dogs with floppy ears, I, I apologize, I'm gonna come back to the pet behavior. Dogs with floppy ears do not by their nature have more problems than dogs with non-floppy ears except for the fact that they don't get aerated real well, that sort of thing. But the vast majority of dogs with floppy ears that have problems with their ears, the ear problem is secondary to an allergy issue. In a perfectly normal dog's ear, everything comes out. The wax migrates out, the skin sloughs to the outside, the hair grows to the outside. And it is a daily occurrence that I will look at a gentleman and say, Mr. Jones, your dog's ears are beautiful. And this dog is five years old. And, Miss, and I'll say, Mr. Jones, when was the last time you had to mess with this dog's ears? And Mr. Jones will look at me and say, Doc, I haven't looked in his ears in two years. And his ears are so pristine, you could drink Pepsi out of them. They're that nice. But so what I tell folks is that even with floppy ears, it is usually secondary to an allergy issue. So the vast majority of dogs who have chronic ear problems, floppy or not, even if you do nothing else, look in them once a week. If you look in them and they look bad, smell bad, or doing bad, you can easily flush them out. When you flush them out, you're doing all the stuff that their ear was supposed to do on its own if it was functioning normally. And that will save you bazillions of dollars at the vet office and tons of trips and all that sort of problem. Um, the other thing that people talk about with floppy ears and non-floppy ears is swimming. Um, I know lots of dogs who do not have allergy issues who swim every day. I got a crabbing buddy who goes crabbing all summer long every day and he goes duck hunting all winter long every year and his dog never has an ear problem and he does nothing. He never looks at his dog's ears and it's simply because he has no allergy issues. So allergies even on the floppy dog's ears are the number one problem. Okay now I'm sorry. Now back to the puppy who's chewing up the furniture. 
So the puppy who's chewing up the furniture, it is nothing you are doing wrong. and It is nothing the dog is doing wrong. The dog thinks that that is his favorite thing to do. So that is what he does. Um, a puppy, and forgive me all the mothers who get offended, a puppy is exactly like your child. And so what you end up having to do with a puppy is the same thing every day. Please stop that and you move the dog over here and you give it something else to do. Um, and you try to give it the chew toy that you want it to chew and you will do it over and over and over and over. And it is very difficult to punish one out of that. So the, the hitting with a newspaper, the kicking across the room, that rarely to never ever works. So I tell folks, you say, stop that, give them a command, move the dog over from what they're doing, try to get their attention somewhere else. Dog's attention span is about 45 seconds when it's a puppy. And so they're running around chewing the furniture and then they look and go, oh, it's a butterfly. You're trying to get them to the butterfly, the chew toy that you want them to chew on. And then my last very bad medical answer is, is that the vast majority of dogs stop chewing by the time they're a year old, the vast majority. No matter what you do or how bad of an owner you are, they're gonna stop on their own anyway. So don't buy new furniture when you have a puppy is the other answer. That's right, wait till they grow out of it, right? There you go. Get the new couch. <laughs> Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Um, next question. So we're moving on from dogs and cats. Um, I don't know who could have submitted this next one, but we're moving <laughs> on to, to rabbit owners. Um, and I have a question that you've seen. It's, it, it was submitted and then I've got a, a follow-up. So I, if I stump you, let me know. Um, but the first question about rabbits is that I heard rabbits could die if they get wet. Is that true? So that's, I know what I could tell you about rabbits, you could hold in a thimble. Um, and in veterinary school, you have to learn about everything, but rabbits was something that we just kind of bypassed most of the time, me and my buddies. Anyway, rabbits are extremely prone to, they will die from almost anything. And it takes very little to upset a rabbit. And so the vast majority of times, let's go back to the water. If a rabbit gets wet, he usually is going to be okay if he is accustomed to getting wet. There's a bazillion wild rabbits who get wet every time it rains. Um, if you know, forgive me for saying this, if you've ever hunted rabbits at all, if you're a country person at all, never hunted rabbits at all, when the dogs are running the rabbits, the rabbits will swim straight across the creek and never slow down. And it doesn't bother them at all. But for a rabbit who is not used to getting wet, that is going to be a shock to the system just because of it. And at the same time, rabbits do have a hard time um, maintaining their body temperature. So they often will get wet. The shock of that bothers them to begin with and at the same time, they're gonna get hypothermia real fast. So it is not good for the pet rabbit, the house rabbit, the rabbit who's not used to it to get wet. Um, if the rabbit's an outside rabbit, he couldn't care less. Okay, follow up, Joel, I'm ready for okay, this one. Follow up. This, this is, hopefully you paid attention in, in rabbit anatomy class. Um, somebody asked, how big is a bunny's heart? A bunny's heart, now Joel, you might know more than me if you've looked this <laughs> up. <laughs> A bunny's heart should be body comparison size the same as any other animal at that size and body weight. So if you've got the, the you and I were talking about rabbits earlier, if you've got the bigger size rabbit, it's going to be, if it's a 12 pound rabbit, it's going to be the same as a 12 pound cat. Um, now that is a, I, if you tell me something different, I'm going to believe you. So that's what I'll say. <laughs> that, that, sound, that sounds good to me. <laughs> They, they are very similar to, to cats, I think, in the, yes. in the proportion. Okay, excellent. Um, great. So, uh, and there's not many rabbit questions because rabbit owners are just generally more informed and educated and, <laughs> and better, I guess. So, uh, moving, <laughs> moving on. Um, I've been looking forward to this question because you have some excellent, uh, interesting pictures to share with us. Um, and so we're moving back to dogs who uh, maybe aren't the smartest in what they eat. And with that, what's the craziest thing you've ever had a dog eat? And let so me you know when you're at, ready for your slides. Yeah, one second. If you work at a vet office very long at all, it will not take you long to see a tremendous amount of pure craziness that dogs will eat. Uh, we're going to show you a few things here in a second. Um, I have removed large chunks of garden hose. Um, I have removed any piece of clothing you can imagine. And yes, let your imagination run wild because we have pulled it all out. Um, anything that you can think of that will possibly fit in a dog's mouth, they will eat. Now, the good Lord made dogs the best vomiters on earth. So nothing throws up like a dog. So the vast majority of dogs that eat crazy stuff don't end up at the vet office. They throw it up on your kitchen floor or more likely on your couch or carpet. And you go, what is that that you ate? And you figure out, oh, that was my sock or that was my, you know, my cell phone cover or something like that. So you see that a lot. 
They also are extremely good at passing things out the back end as well. So you'll see do dogs pass some crazy stuff that you never thought would go through them. But um, Joel's got a list. Of, Joel, pull us up. We'll show some of the crazy stuff we'll talk about in a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is a good one. So this is one that this is a little bit harder to see. I forgot to put this one in here. This is a, the, a picture of a dog laying on its side. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Emily's giving me some pointers here. Oh, God. Anyway, so this picture, if you look very, very close at the top of the picture is the dog's backbone. To the top right is the dog's tail. Um, there you go. And then down to the back end, you can see the two back legs going down, the stripy parts up at towards the front or the ribs. And then in the middle is the abdomen itself. Now, depending on how good your internet is, there's mine coming back up a little bit. If you start to look right there where Joel is with his arrow, you're looking at the backbone, several backbones of several puppies. This is a pregnant dog. The dog did not eat these puppies. She's getting ready to have these puppies in another couple of weeks. Um, if you look up to the end of a couple of those backbones, you'll see kind of a more hard circular area right there, Joel, that's it. That is a puppy head. And so we often will take x-rays anytime 45 days past breeding, you can take x-rays and see and start to count the number of puppies a dog has. That's just an interesting one because you can see the babies, but no, she did not eat these. Okay, Joel, next one. Okay, this is a beautiful one here. So this is a dog that thought that it would be a great thing. They had had a cookout the day before, and this is the same view. This is a lateral view, backbone at the top, stripy part is the ribs, the back legs are there to the back. And all of this, you have to remember on an x-ray, the harder something is, the whiter it is. So if you look at this, this is actually even more white than the bones themselves. So when you see that, this is almost metallic. What they had done is they had had a great big pig picking the day before, washed everything with a giant hunk of steel wool. It was covered in pig fat and the dog decided it would be good to eat all the pieces of steel wool. And so you can see all the clumps going through this dog in a long train type of procession here. Um, this particular dog, believe it or not, did not have to have surgery. Remember I said the dogs can pass tons of crazy stuff. We put this dog on a, for lack of a better word, we gave it a giant enema and put it on canned pumpkin uh, to act like fiber and every came, thing came out the following day in a giant mess. Anyway, and the dog's doing great. Okay, next one, Joel. This was a great one. This is an English bulldog. Um, this bulldog has come to see me. This is the second or third time that we did surgery on this dog. This dog came in and the owner said, I don't know what's wrong with this dog. He was here for regular vaccines that day. She said, but he's walking funny. And my licensed technician was just doing a physical exam. And she said, Tracy, it feels like something's crackling on the inside. And so I went and fell to the dog and I said, that is a great one. We laid the dog on the x-ray table and got this and the dog had, this was a cooking thing again, so be careful what you cook. They had had some sort of fish fry or something the day before, spilled some grease in their little flower bed. And these are the decorative pebbles and rocks that the grease spilled on. The dog ate all of these up to the front, to the left where the big portion is, we had to do surgery to remove it or empty the stomach of that. The ones that are back to the right are in the, the colon and they ended up passing out the back end anyway. But this dog's doing great. We also out of this same dog removed a, about two years before this, a bunch of mulch. So the dog likes to eat crazy stuff, but they don't dump anything in their, in their uh, flower beds anymore after they cook it. So anyway, next one, Joel. This is my favorite one. This lady watched her dog in front of her before she could get to it, swallow her engagement ring. She was not married yet. She came in and she said, my dog ate my engagement ring. God help me, please save me. And she was very worried. She hadn't told her husband yet. And you can see the ring sitting right there just as bright and beautiful as you ever saw. This one was actually still in the stomach and we were trying to help lady out as fast as we could. So at the vet office, we don't use peroxide. We have an injectable medication that you can give that's even a little more potent than peroxide to make them um, vomit or throw up. And so we gave the dog an injectable medication and five minutes later out the ring comes back up the front end. And um, I had a picture of the lady wearing it on her finger after this, after we washed it up really good, but I could not find that. But anyway, so they ended up getting married and the husband was none the wiser. So that all went well. Anyway, that's that one. Those are my favorite things, so to speak, Joel. Excellent. Um, uh, all's, well, all's well that ends well, right? All's well that ends well, exactly. <laughs> um, excellent. Okay. Um, so thank you for, for sharing those, uh, those images with us. That's um, some crazy stuff. Um, moving on, uh, dogs. 
how important is it to brush my dog's teeth? Okay, I'm gonna give you Tracy, your doctor answer, then I'm gonna give you Tracy, your friend answer. So get ready. The doctor and me will tell you that if you brush your dog's teeth twice a day, every day, that will be spectacular and you will probably have less dental work done on your dog than you would if you did not. Um, that is the same advice I try to give myself every day. Um, Tracy, your friend will tell you that some dogs love their teeth brushed and some dogs look at you like you have lost your mind if you think you're gonna brush their teeth. Um, and so I tell folks, anything that you do for your dog's teeth is better than nothing. Um, and that includes brushing with toothbrush and either dog flavored toothpaste that's approved for dogs or baby toothpaste. Human toothpaste or adult toothpaste is bad only because if they swallow it, it gets them nauseous a lot. Um, but baby toothpaste, which is made to swallow or um, dog toothpaste is great. A lot of people will also use a finger brush. It works good because you can reach around and do all the stuff or be cheap and get a four before gauze sponge or a soft white cloth. What you're trying to do is remove the plaque. The plaque's gonna turn into tartar and harden and make a mess. Now, here's Tracy, your real friend to tell you something. The vast majority of dogs that are gonna have bad teeth are gonna have bad teeth almost no matter what you do. Think about some of your friends. Some people go to the dentist three times a year and when they're 20 years old, their teeth are already starting to fall out. And then some people, um, some people never go to the dentist and eat candy all the time and their teeth look great when they're 75 years old. Dogs are very much in that same category and so are cats. And if you try to brush your cat's teeth, please send me a video of it. Um, it's not gonna happen or go real well. Anyway, so with that being said, if there's any veterinarians in the group, they're gonna all say, no, Tracy stinks because he's telling you not to brush his dog's teeth. I'm not, it is just very difficult. And you're gonna end up with a few dentals in your dog's life anyway. If your doctor tells you your dog needs a dental, it probably does. If you, there are some veterinarians who are gonna tell you you need a dental routinely every six months or every year. Um, I never try to contradict another veterinarian. That is probably not correct. It should be very tailored to the specific dog. I have some dogs that are six years old and their teeth look like they're one year old. I have some dogs that are two years old and their teeth are terrible. Um, so that's my kind of blunt dog toothbrushing answer. Good stuff. Okay, um, keeping up with, uh, with care of pets at home, um, teeth brushing. Uh, this question is about nails. Can I safely cut my pet's nails at home? And if so, um, do you have some tips or tricks to help us do that safely? Yeah, so I'll start with a pessimistic statement. The number one reason for a veterinarian or veterinary staff or a groomer getting bit, scratched, hurt, or thrown on the floor is trying to trim a dog's toenails. Most, most is a big word. A lot of dogs absolutely hate it, and they think that you're trying to cut their heart out when you do it. So all the way back to the puppy, if you have a puppy, Take your dog's feet and touch it five times a day. Rub your fingers between it. Rub something on its toenails. Make it not scared of it. Because most dogs are not being upset with you because they are mad at you or because they want to bite you. They're upset with you because they're scared and they don't know what you're doing. Um, if you want to have some fun, grab a 100-pound Rottweiler that's three years old, never had his toenails trimmed, and try to do that for the first time because he will not let you. He's going to tell you no thank you. Um, and so I tell folks it is safe to do at home. Um, when you begin, turn their leg in a manner that makes sense to their anatomy. If you've ever seen a farrier trim a horse's feet, he pulls the back feet up behind, the front feet up behind, kind of do it like that so it feels good to the dog. Have somebody holding the dog. Um, if you think your dog won't bite you when you trim its toenails, I promise you it will. Not always, but some of them will. So do not hesitate to watch out for that. Um, and when you start going, try to keep going. Um, be a chicken, trim a little bit. You're just trying to get the dog used to it to begin with. You will get good at it over time. When we train folks at the vet office on how to trim toenails, we do it on dogs that are anesthetized because we know they're going to make a mess. Um, you cannot, you can hurt your dog and make your dog not like you very much if you trim them and quick their nails. You are not going to cause any massive medical trauma to the dog. Um, the dog's not going to bleed out from it even if he starts to bleed. If you do it, have a rag close by and something to stick on that toenail if it starts to bleed, some flour, rub it with a bar of soap, silver nitrate works really well. Um, if your dog becomes absolutely unhinged and says, no, thank you, just stop, because it's, it's, it's not worth it to you because your dog's gonna end up going, I hate you, I want you to go away. Um, some dogs are really good for it, some dogs are really bad for it, really bad. And like I said, it's not an aggression, I'm mad and I hate you issue, it is a, I don't know what you're doing, I'm scared to death of it issue. Cats are the same way. Some cats will lay there and they'll take it from you and some of them will not. But if you start early, trim early, mess with them early, mess with them with their babies, it's, it's no big deal to them. No big deal at all. Yeah, that's okay. a great, great piece of advice from the, from the time they were a puppy. Do yourself a favor. Exactly. Um, okay, good. 
uh, so we've just got a few questions left here. Um, the next one, a very specific question is catch is cat scratch fever a real thing? Yes, cat scratch fever is a real thing. So um, I'll give you the quick boring story. When I was uh, 18 years old, I was getting ready to go to my senior palm on Friday. I worked at a vet office. I worked there since I was 16. I was bitten by a cat on the top of my right index finger knuckle. It swelled up so bad. By Monday, I was in a hospital. My prom was on Friday, and the doctor only let me go because it was my prom. And I was on IV antibiotics the whole time, and I had cat scratch fever. At the time, they could not correlate why cat scratch fever or exactly what it was. They had isolated a bacteria called Bartonella. It's called Bartonella helensiae or helensiae. Anyway, it's a Bartonella um, bacteria. And they thought that the cats harbored it and they did not know why. The crazy interesting thing is, is that that particular bacteria is actually in flea feces. And so when you had the cat that was scratching itself or doing that sort of thing, licking itself, we didn't know at the time as to why that was happening, but they were picking that up in their nail beds and everything. And so they called it cat scratch fever because you get scratch and you get the fever, but it was technically from the feces of the flea that the cat had, crazy enough. But, um, but yes, it is a thing. It's treated by antibiotics. And most of the time you don't go through what I go through. We get bit and scratched all the time and rarely have any issue from it. But it is a real thing. Okay. Follow-up yeah. question to that. So it sounds like it's a good idea to keep your pets flea free. Excellent. And so uh, follow-up question, which heartworm, flea, tick medication do you recommend? Okay. So my blunt, not so grand answer is any heartworm and flea or tick medication that you will remember to give is the one that you want to give. Um, my brother, uh, he, he says a blunt statement sometimes in the year 2021, if your animal has fleas, that is your own fault. And he's somewhat right about that. I never blame anybody when they have problems and if they need help. Um, so let's do the heartworm stuff first. We'll do that real quick. There are many, many heartworm preventions. There's only about four different active ingredients. So a lot of them have overlap on themselves. Um, my favorite one is an injectable medication called ProHeart. Um, ProHeart comes in two formulations that either last six months per injection or 12 months per injection. It is not my favorite because it works any better. All heartworm preventions are approximately 99.5% effective at preventing heartworms. ProHeart is exceptionally good because you give it and you forget about it. You don't have to worry about it anymore. In the United States, the average dog that goes to the veterinarian gets heartworm pills six months out of the year. And that's not because the owners are bad. It's because if I take my father 12 months worth of heartworm pills right now and tell him to give them to his dog, he's going to probably end up giving five or six over a 12 month period. That's just human nature. You forget about it. Um, and so that's, that's the big thing with heartworm prevention. Um, now, if you're good at pills, the pills are great. They're 99.5% effective. It does not matter if you're using uh, Interceptor, Trifexis, um, some Paracut. There's a whole lot of different products out there. Um, HeartGuard's been around for 25 years. It still works great. So those are all very, very good. The flea and tick industry became kind of, I call it the revolution of the flea and tick industry about five years ago, um, a type of product came out that was an oral product. And um, it was the first oral medication that you could give that was effective against fleas and ticks. And, and all of them are extremely effective. Um, there are several that last for 30 days. Uh, the brand names are NexGuard, um, very good product. Credelio is a very good product. Simperica is a very good product. Um, the the one we like the most is simply because it's the most owner compliant. It's called Brevecto. You give one pill and it lasts for 90 days at a time. That same study that looked at how many dogs got flea and tick medication 12 months out of the year, the average dog got it for three and a half months out of the year. And so if you give two Brevectos, you're already ahead of the game by six months. So those are the, I always try to do what is the easiest because as far as what is the best, they're all in the same category as the best. But if you, whatever your vet says, if it's working for you and you're doing it all the time, do it because they, they all work very, very well. And everybody, every veterinarian has their own favorite. Excellent. So consistency and, and consistency. sticking with it is, consistency. Yeah, is the key. Exactly. Awesome. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so we're, we're getting close to time and I've got uh, three questions left, but the last two I'm going to kind of put together. Um, so this one I think is a quick answer, but we'll see. Okay. Um, why does my pet eat grass? Um, so animals, dogs eat grass, dogs and cats. They eat grass for two reasons. One reason is... And this is the one that most people talk about is that the dog or cat is eating grass because it has an upset stomach from something. And that does happen. So if your dog never eats grass routinely and it goes outside or cat 
and he goes outside and decides to start eating grass, it has probably either got an upset stomach for some reason, acid, acid issues, it probably ate something you didn't know it ate in the yard yesterday, and it's doing that to A, help soothe itself, and to help itself throw up, because a lot of times a dog will eat grass and then vomit. Cats are the exact same way. Then there's the other type of dog that eats grass. Um, there are some dogs that eat grass because they think it's fun and it tastes good. Um, and my dog would go and graze on grass like a Angus cow. She walked around and would pick her favorite pieces and eat it, and she ate it every day. So if your dog eats grass every day, it is not something that you're feeding it wrong or it's not a nutrition issue. It is very rare for a dog in the United States that is eating a brand name food that you buy at any grocery store or any pet food store to have a nutrition issue for their, for their dog to be eating grass or dirt or something it's just because they think it's fun. Okay, good. Gotcha. Good stuff. Yeah, so nine times out of 10, it sounds like if a dog does something, it's because they like it. They think exactly. It's <laughs> good. Awesome. Okay, um, Tracy, this has been awesome. Uh, super informative. Thanks for your time. And so there are two questions left, but I'm going to lump them together because they, they kind of go together. And so the first one um, is about vet school in particular and, and whether or not you had to take a class for each animal or how extensive that was. And as you answer that, I'd also like you to, to sort of address, um, there's a young person in my life who wants to go to vet school. What advice do you have? Okay, so the, as far as the classes go, let's do vet school first real fast. You, to go to vet school, you're gonna apply to whatever college it is and you're gonna go to your undergraduate. And you, then you're gonna take whatever requirements are needed to go to vet school, then you apply to vet school. It's like going to graduate school. You're just gonna apply to vet school and then prayerfully you get accepted. On one side plug for that, um, if you are going to try to go to veterinary school, the best veterinary school to go to, if you have one in your home state, is the one to go to. Um, so for most of us here, we're either North Carolina or Virginia. So if you are a resident of North Carolina, you need to apply to NC State University in Raleigh. It's the only one in the state. There's only like 29 or 30 in the country anyway. But the reason I say that is because it is, A, going to be a tiny bit easier for you to get into because they are going to favor residents of the state. And B, it is going to cost you less because your tax dollars are paying for that as a public uh, government type school. Virginia Tech is the exact same way in Virginia. Um, it is, it's going to be a little easier to get into because they're going to take more students from the state than they are out of state and it costs a little bit less. As far as the classes go, once you get there, everybody, now it's been a long time, but it's still very similar to this. Everybody takes the same core set of things. Um, so everybody's going to learn about horses and cats and cows and dogs and reptiles and things like that. As you get towards the, your junior year, your third year and your fourth year, you're going to be able to pick a little bit more. You're going to have your core classes, but you're going to pick a little bit more of, okay, I'm into reptiles. So they're going to put you in some blocks with more reptiles. Whereas if you're into dogs and cats, you're going to be over here more in small animal stuff. So the answer is yes, with a caveat of just depending on which way you're trying to go. The, the good slash crazy part is once you walk out of veterinary school with a license, you're licensed to work on any animal on the planet earth, except for a human being. Um, so that's one thing I always tell folks that that's cool. Doesn't mean you should, but you legally can, so to speak. Um, as far as, oh, one other thing that Emily was just telling me, the, I was telling my nephew, he was, uh, he was here this weekend with me or this past week with me working a little bit. The, the cool thing about being a veterinarian is that you have the power to prescribe any drug that you want to. Now, of course, it's all gotta be legal, but you have the power to prescribe any drug up to and above anything that a human doctor can prescribe because a human doctor can only prescribe what is legal for a human to take. Whereas a veterinarian can prescribe all the human drugs they want and all the dog drugs they want. So you get this big buffet of stuff. And on a side note, a tremendous amount of the medications that we use for your dog are the same stuff you would take, the exact same stuff you would take. Now back on the one with um, the, the biggest advice to go to vet school, so two or three things, and Emily says I get on my soapbox when I start talking about this, but I'll, two or three things to think about when you go to vet school. Number one is make sure that that is what you want to do. It, it, it is too much money, too much time, and too much commitment to go through that, and some of it's misery, and to go through that misery and walk out and go, man, this stinks, I don't want to do that. Um, and so I tell folks, go work for a vet, but don't just go work for a vet for a day or two. Go and deal with Mrs. Jones, who is mad, and the day that the dog pooped in your hair and all that stuff. You got to go through all that misery to make sure that that's what you really, and that's any job. That's what you really want to do. So you, you make sure you get a bunch of experience and, um, and see the goods, the bads, the ins and the outs. And you've got to be able to deal with the public and that sort of thing. Um, and then as far as getting into vet school, there are 
always different criteria for the different vet schools. Most of them are overlapping. So they want X amount of hours of experience at the shelter and some stuff over here. And you got to do work at the vet office over there and get some large animal experience. The number one way to get into vet school is grades. And it does not matter what happens after that. If you have the grades, especially in the state schools, there will always be, it, 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 it will vary depending on the year and the applicant pool they have. But if you have the grades above X for that year, you're getting in as long as you have hit all the other requirements. Um, and so I tell folks, if you got good grades, you're gonna get into school, period. That's just the way it is. And, and maybe that's the way it should be, maybe it's not, but that's just the way it is. Also, one other thing on a side note, the vast majority of people in the veterinary world entering, even since I was in school, are believe it or not girls now. Um, or females. Now, when I was um, in veterinary school, NC State accepted 72 people per year. They're still right around that number. And I think there was 11 guys in the group and the rest were ladies. And my associate veterinarian graduated in 2006, same number, 72. I think six were gentlemen. And they've had several classes at some of the schools across the country that were all females, um, or all ladies. So nothing wrong with that, just this part of it. But uh, anyway, just a trivial, I mean, a trivial piece for you there.